you found Sunday Night Live, your weekly online magazine programme full of news, views and worship from around the Christian world. This week, the gifts that say I love you and the most precious gift of all. Unconditional love expressed in beautiful works of art. How to support a teenager with depression. And what would Jesus make of Valentine's Day? And please, if you enjoy what you see, don't forget to press the subscribe and the like buttons so that you'll be reminded of the programme next week and more people will get the chance to watch it. Hello again from me, Pam Rhodes, and welcome to a lovely edition of Sunday Night Live because it's Valentine's Day and maybe roses and chocolates are heading your way today. But even if they're not, I hope that you know you are loved, even if you can't hug or even see those you love at the moment. But here on Sunday Night Live, we are full of love. And as Graham Kendrick and his friends wish to remind us, a little bit of love goes a long, long way. A little bit of love goes a long, long way. A little love, a little love, a little bit of love and I'm on my a little love, a long way, but we'll get there together. A long way, but we'll get there soon. Along the way, we can lean on each other. A little love goes a long, long way. A little love, a little love, a little bit of love, and the sun comes shining. A little love. A little love, a little bit of kindness and someone smiling. A little love, a little love, a long way but we'll get there together. A long way but we'll get there soon. Along the way we can lean on each other. A little love goes a long, long way. A little love, a little love. Drops of rain can trickle down into a puddle Then the puddles get together Making streams and make a river The rivers fill the valleys with a roaring and a rushing Then the little drops of rain have made a wide, 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 wide ocean A long way but we'll get there together A long way but we'll get there soon Along the way we can lean on each other a little love goes a long, long way A long way, but we'll get there together A long way, but we'll get there soon Along the way, we can lean on each other A little love goes a long, long way A little love, a little love, a little love Well, that set us off in a loving mood and there will be many gifts exchanged between Valentine's today, although perhaps the best gift of all is one with a Christian message which will stay true long after that bunch of flowers has wilted. Marion Needham Bennett knows all about suggestions for Valentine's because she runs the Christian Gift Company, although for her the most precious gift of all is one that costs no money. Hello Pam and thank you. It's lovely to be with you here on Valentine's Day, a day when traditionally we can give a card or a gift to someone to express our love for them. At the Christian Gift Company we have a whole range of cards and gifts that speak of God's lo amazing love for us and point us to Jesus and to his word. And over the last two or three weeks, we've sent out a lot of cards and gifts which are clearly have been destined to be given out today by someone to someone else as an expression of their love. The thing with human love is that it always comes to an end, whether through separation or death, it's finite, it comes to an end. But the thing with God's love is that it's everlasting. There is no end to it. It's like a permanent river that flows out of the heart of God. God's love is unconditional. It's unquenchable. It's unstoppable. And sometimes it's really quite unexpected. The love that which God loves us with is called agape love. And it's a selfless, self-sacrificial love given without counting the cost 
It's the love that sent Jesus from heaven where he took off his crown, took off his robe and came to earth to take on our humanity and our frailty, our sins, our poverty and our weakness. It's the same love that sent Jesus to the cross to die for our sins, to pay the price for our sins with his blood and with his body. Jesus, the sinless, spotless lamb, went to the cross to pay the price for our sins. And not only that, but he also rose again. And in doing so, he overcame death and assured for us eternal life. Love transforms lives, doesn't it? We know that even if we give a little bit of love out away to somebody, it can make their day, their week, and sometimes it can even change their lives. And Jesus changed the lives of people with his love wherever he went during his ministry. He changed the life of the leper, of Jairus' daughter, of the woman with the issue of bleeding, of the, the con man Zacchaeus, of Lazarus, who he, when he raised him from the dead, and of course of Peter, who he restored after Peter denied Jesus three times. Love transforms lives. You may or may not have received a Valentine's card or gift today. But if you have received the gift of Jesus into your life, you have received the most precious gift that can ever be given and received. The gift of forgiveness, of eternal life with our Heavenly Father, a life that goes on and on in his love. And if you haven't received Jesus into your life, why not do that today? It's a gift that's given for absolutely everybody. And all we have to do is to reach out and say, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me on the cross. Receive the gift and say, I'm so sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. And then unwrap and open the gift and say, Jesus, please come into my heart and be Lord of my life today. And God's love will be transformational in your life then too. Bless you and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Well, Marianne mentioned there agape, which is the old Greek word for the giving of time, energy, resources and love without expecting anything in return. Now, starting for a month at Gallery Different in London is an exhibition called The Kiss, for which a group of very talented international artists were asked to create paintings and sculptures that express that unconditional love. Well, here are some of those artists now to talk about how that theme inspired their work. Hi, I'm Ali. I am a painter with Gallery Different and I'm also a priest. In many ways, Christian worship is a way of holding on to a sense of love, a sense of God's love, of reminding ourselves, of feeling closer to him. It's a, it's a way of holding something that is precious. But ultimately, I think agape is a love that can only come from outside of us. It's a gift. Um, and that's why I painted this side of the the painting predominantly, almost as a as light, but also I wanted it almost to be a kind of richness, like like gold almost dripping down. This idea that light can be absorbed and held, but ultimately that we are held by light. And I think that for me in my own personal journey with faith, there have been times where I have definitely held on to faith, but actually it's always been the agape the unconditional love of god that has actually held me even when i felt i can't hold on any longer i suddenly realized that i've been being held the whole time by this light hi i'm tara winona i'm an artist a painter and i'm speaking to you from my studio in sydney in australia my, my tree of life is created from the dancing bodies of humanity. When I create the trees, they're, they're a meditation for me. 
they're, they're like a, a visual prayer that I hope is helping to make the world a better place. It's a symbol of my hopes, my dreams and my aspirations, but also my hopes for humanity. Hello, my name is Laura Beaumont and I live in North London and I make book sculptures. When I heard that Gallery Different were going to be doing the KISS exhibition and it was going to be about the Garpe, which to me is unconditional love, I thought it had to be something about the, the, the beginning of this lockdown, the beginning of the pandemic, when everything was so weird and strange and unknown to all of us. And the figures that were really, really shining out from all of this were the doctors and the nurses. And of course, you know, the, the, the dust men, the, the dustbin men, the, the shopkeepers, the supermarket workers, the delivery drivers, people that were, that, that were going out of their way to look after everybody, that were, that were sacrificing so much of their time and, and their lives to, to look after us all. And that to me was like unconditional love. I mean, that whole thing about loving each other, looking after each other. And of course, the, the overriding image to me was of the nurse. I'm Richard Chapman, I'm a sculptor. And over the last 10 or 15 years, I've worked occasionally on a series called Symbiotic, which is two figures that are integral to each other, yet can be placed apart as well. The piece you see behind me is, is the latest in the series called Symbiosis. And the figures, whilst they are very much together, can also be moved apart and placed in different directions. However, they still have a sym symbiotic nature to them. And for me, this is very much what love should be. Two separate people connected, but still able to be themselves. Hi, I'm Hazel Reeves and I'm a figurative sculptor telling stories in bronze. And I wanted to introduce you to this bronze piece, Blow the Clouds Away. At these times, all of us need to come together and focus on that distant horizon, those blue skies, which we know will come, but will get there quicker if together we can help each other and each help to blow those clouds off into the distance to bring those blue skies more quickly to all of us. Well, that exhibition was called The Kiss, and that is also the title of the poem that we're about to hear, written by Pauline Lewis, who not so long ago celebrated her 90th birthday. Now, Pauline has always enjoyed expressing her thoughts in poetry, and it's Valentine's Day when her thoughts have turned to her late husband. I wonder, was he the romantic sort? My husband was up once asked when he last gave his wife flowers. And uh, he never gave me flowers, actually, but he couldn't be lost for a word. So he said, I give my wife flowers every day. Tulips. Tulips. So after that, tulips were our favourite flowers. But after he died, I was going out to see the tulips in Holland, the tulip fields in Holland. And uh, God gave me this beautiful meditation and Pam has asked that I might share it with you. The kiss. Butterfly gentle caress on the brow of the sleeping child. Father heart strong embrace for the sun turned again from the wild. Peace in the place of warfare. Tears kissed from the sorrowful one. Ardent strength of the lover who feels life has only begun. But what of the kiss of our maker, breathing life in the form he has made? And the worshipful kiss of the maiden in whose arms as a babe he was laid. The cost of the kiss of our saviour. Crossing out all the wrongs we have done. And the bliss of the kiss of our Lord for his church at the marriage feast of the Lamb. Pauline Lewis there. And just think how many marriages have started with one particular hymn being sung during the wedding ceremony. Love Divine. You know the words, but here's Paul Slaughter to provide the music.
And we're still in a romantic mood because we're about to hear a remarkable love story that spanned more than 80 years. Here's Louise Moores with a tale to warm your heart. Hello, this is Louise Morse with the Pilgrim's Friends Society with some thoughts about this Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is all about love. And, you know, there's a saying that love is blind that happens to be really true. When we fall in love, in that first blinding, all-encompassing love, our brains release chemicals that make us completely oblivious to any faults in the beloved. We become fixated with them. The true test of love is how it develops over time, as we develop the relationship, as we learn that he or she squeezes a toothpaste from the bottom of the tube and doesn't put things away, for example. Love isn't so blind then, but love grows deeper. In my work with the Pilgrim's Friend Society, I work with older people, and sometimes we meet couples who've come into our care homes because they're very old, but it means that as a couple, they've usually been married for most of their life, the best part of their lives they've lived with one another. And this is how it was with Ron and Babs Lintot. They were living in our care home in Hazelmere in Surrey, when I heard that they were about to celebrate their 81st wedding anniversary, I'd planned to go down and interview them and take pictures. And then a few days before their anniversary, Babs, who was 100, fell out of bed, broke a hip, and sadly died in hospital. So I rang the manager and said that probably he really didn't feel like speaking to me now. And she said, no, on the contrary, he can't wait to meet you. So I went along and found this lively 103 year old chap full of stories about how they'd met and their lives together. They met in the 1920s when he'd gone to help with the hay gathering at a farm in Surrey where Babs was working, helping the elderly farmer's wife. And it was love at first sight. They caught it for a couple of years. Do you remember that old fashioned word? They caught it. They got to know each other for a couple of years. And then Babs was sent to Canada to help a relative. It was the custom there if an elderly relative needed help, an unmarried daughter would go and help her. So Ron, undaunted, worked his fare over on a boat to Canada and got a job in a farm near where Babs was living. And they got to know each other there. They married in Saskatoon, Canada in 1927. So how did Ron feel after planning to celebrate his 81st wedding anniversary? and then have Babs die before him. And he said, you know, I'm 103, so I don't think it's going to be too long before I join her. He actually lived to be 106, but he was held by his love for her, by his love for the Lord, and by the knowledge that it wouldn't be long before they were together again. And I asked him the one question that you have to ask every person who's over the age of 100. What do you put your long life down to? And Ron thought about it and he said, you know, Louise, it's not any one thing. When I look back now, I can see that God planned it all. He put everything in place. He brought me and Babs together. He was the one who did everything and he was contented and then I realized that I'd been listening to a story of where love was indeed stronger than death. My song is love the Savior's love for me, love to the loveless, shown that they might love me. Be. For who am I that in my place my Lord should take from? 
and flesh and to come on Sunday Night Live, the chart-topping choir Libera sing Deep Peace, how to support a teenager with depression, and what would Jesus make of Valentine's Day? Most of our church buildings may have been off limits during this pandemic, but across the country, church members have been busier than ever, not only supporting their own congregation, but reaching out into their local communities to answer any need that they see. So let's find out what's been happening in the southeast of England from the team leader of the Southeast Baptist Association, the Reverend Stuart Davison. Hello. I'm Stuart Davison and I'm a regional minister serving Baptist churches in the southeast of England. Johnny, do you know when your church was founded? asked the pastor. Founded? said Johnny. I didn't even know it was losted. The church is not lost and has not stopped. We Baptists believe the church is the people, not the building. Yes, we are the gathered people of God. But we still gather in the virtual world and will gather in person again. And we are here and functioning in food banks, in the community, in our homes, online, in hospitals and in our neighbourhoods. The Lighthouse Church, for example, is in a very needy area of the South Coast. They are a small Baptist fellowship. 20 would have been a good attendance on a Sunday but they're very enthusiastic and care for their community. Paul Moore is the pastor. Last year, they felt God telling them to start a food bank. They are now feeding about 100 people every week. Taking their services onto Facebook, they now get over 500 people tuning in. A young man with a drug habit stayed online after the service to share his story. His mum who tunes in and used to be local but now lives up in County Durham, was concerned for her son. She told him to tune in. He did, and he's now attending the prayer meeting, 
receiving help and on the road to recovery. A man came to the food bank. His condition concerned them so much uh, that he was followed up on. He was found in a flat with no heating and nearly dead. With the help of the local GP, they got him into hospital. His flat was cleaned, a bed and a fridge freezer put in, and he is now back home and recovering well. Now, by contrast, Tunbridge Baptist Church has over 400 members and is in a very different area. Yet the need for the food bank has continued to grow. Over 175 families are fed every week through the food bank and the walk-ins. Their online presence is also much greater than the usual Sunday services. Their premises are now being used for a vaccination hub for the area. In the summer, they had an outside programme for kids and young people. Like other churches, they phone folk who are on their own. At Christmas, they worked with a local pub to provide meals and gave out over, over 500 food hampers. One of the guys who has helped every week said, You're all right, you lot. Everyone else is shut, but you're still here. You were here before the pandemic, and you're still here doing it now. Well, feeding children has been very much in the news, hasn't it? And, and whilst not telling you which football team I support... I have been very pleased that Marcus Rashford has led the challenge to the government in this. However, many of our churches have been getting on with things anyway, right the way across the country. A Baptist church called One Church, Brighton, in conjunction with others, runs something called Chomp, which feeds children and now supports whole families with food boxes. The church initiated a farmer's market in the lanes in Brighton. And they sell their own produce there, as well as ethically sourced coffee, which they roast themselves. It's called Skylark Coffee, by the way. So the church is still here in the southeast, as in the rest of the country. Nurses and doctors, carers, neighbours, shop workers, Christians who are being the presence of Christ in our communities. The church existed for three centuries without buildings and saw tremendous growth. During the Cold War, our brothers and sisters in the East continued to worship, often without the privilege of meeting together. Our buildings are great tools for the work of the kingdom, when we have them, and can be a burden when they become worshipped for themselves or have preservation orders slapped on them. When Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, on this rock I will build my church, he was not talking about a slab of concrete or a pile of bricks. A Sunday school teacher asked her class, why is it necessary to be quiet in church? And she got the reply, because people are sleeping. Well, the church is not asleep, nor is it losted. We are still here and awake. A politician said last year, the church has stopped doing God and started doing good. Well, we haven't stopped doing either. And we do good because we do God. Mental health is headline news at the moment, with so many people suffering from depression and other challenges because of the effects and the restrictions of the pandemic. But even before the lockdown, it was recognised that many of our young people are suffering from depression in a way that isn't recognised or treated. Well, for her new book, Why Do I Feel Like This?, Rachel Lane was able to draw on her own experience and throw some light on how we might help our younger generation. There's little doubt that the last 10 months have been an incredibly difficult time for young people and for their parents. So already we were hearing so much about this epidemic of mental health issues among our young people and the worrying levels of depression, anxiety, self-harm and eating disorders. The months of lockdowns and social restrictions have made this even more of a struggle. One of the tendencies that many people have when they're anxious or depressed is to withdraw and to opt out of normal life. 
And of course that's the very thing that we've all had to do, to greater or lesser extents, during this pandemic. And yet so often this can lead us into a downward spiral. So our mental health is bound to suffer when we're shut indoors, isolated, cut off from other people, often spending too much time in front of a screen. And when you add to this the, the uncertainty that many young people face over their futures, the exams being on again, off again, the results and college places up in the air. Many others have struggled to self-motivate and engage with online learning and have fallen behind academically. Well, there's no easy answers to any of this, but there are things we can be doing as parents to support and encourage our children. And when I look back on my own teenage years, which were a very rocky time for me emotionally. One thing that strikes me is how valuable it was to me that my parents just kept normal life going. So it might sound odd, but just the little things like my mum doing laundry and putting meals on the table, looking after us all, keeping life safe and predictable. Those things can't be taken for granted, especially in a time when many of us parents too might be struggling with our mental health. So I think one of the most important things we can do for our children is to keep going ourselves and to look after ourselves so that we're okay and can be there for them. As Christian parents, of course, a huge part of this is nurturing our own relationship with the Lord, however busy we are. And we are busy juggling work and home learning and everything else. But our time in God's word, the time we spend in prayer is our daily lifeline. And it really is the best thing we can do for our children as well as for ourselves. So wherever they might be spiritually at the moment, whether they're professing or whether they're showing a complete lack of interest, our own spiritual life will have an impact on them. Our modelling what it looks like to trust in God daily through difficult times will have an impact. More practically, we can obviously model how to stay sane and look after ourselves by getting outside when we can and encouraging them to do the same eating well, sticking to good sleeping patterns, finding new hobbies or projects to do. Obviously, our relationship with our children changes as they get older. And it might be that a lot of our efforts meet with resistance. How much we push will probably depend on the personality of our child and what sort of relationship we have with them. For some teenagers, gentle encouragement and a good example may be all that we can do. But I do think that our own example is still important and continuing to ask our children to do things with us. Maybe we can ask them to walk the dog with us, um, even if they only say yes once every three days. That's still worthwhile. So from our side, we need to put as much into the relationship as we can. And that's really difficult at the moment when we're under a huge amount of pressure. But perhaps we can pray for opportunities, ways that we can draw near to our children in the busyness. Exercising together, playing a board game, watching a movie, whatever it is they're willing to do with us. Having said all of that, I know that what I most need to be reminded of is to pray for my children. So often we can feel like what we do is most important and what we, the praying is the bit in brackets, but it, it's completely the other way around and often it's when we really start praying about things that change starts to happen. I love the verse in James that says he gives more grace. Well more grace is what we all need at the moment and God is ready and willing to pour it out on us if we ask him. This is such a difficult time for families and a lot of relationships are under huge strain at the moment. But we're not alone. We have a saviour who longs to help us when we draw near to him in our need.
Ben Tanner is a curate in Sheffield and he's been thinking about Valentine's Day and how it makes some of us feel loved and cherished, whilst for others it accentuates the fact that love is quite thin on the ground for them at the moment. And so he's been wondering what Jesus would make of Valentine's Day. Here's Ben. Roses are red, violets are blue. We're all in lockdown, so I can't see you. It's Valentine's Day. And I wonder what Jesus would say to us on Valentine's Day 2021. Valentine's Day is one of those days, isn't it, that is really divisive. So for some, uh, they're really happy on Valentine's Day. Maybe they're single and happy and content with that. Uh, Maybe they're in a relationship that's going well and it's wonderful. Uh, But for others, it can be a really lonely or difficult day, especially if relationships are hard uh, or we're in lockdown on our own. What would Jesus say to us on Valentine's Day? Well, I think the first thing he'd want to say to us is, you're not alone. He promises those of us who know him that we are never, ever alone. He never forsakes us or leaves us. In fact, one of the Proverbs says this, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. The Lord sticks closer than a brother. He is with you every moment of every day. He sees uh, everything you do, which means nothing is insignificant. Uh, He is with you as you get up, as you go to bed. It might feel like you are completely alone in the house, but that is not true. The Lord is with you. And he wants you to know that there is no tear that you shed or laugh that you give that he is not there for, that he doesn't hear. But he also wants you to know that if you're a member of the church family uh, and have other uh, church family friends uh, around you, you're not alone. He makes us brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers. Uh, So if today is a day when you're quite content, it's a great day to be reaching out to your brothers and sisters in your church family. Similarly, if today's hard, reach out. But secondly, I think you'd want to say it's not wrong to long. It's not wrong to long for things not to be like this, uh, for us not to be distanced from others. It's not wrong to long for a closeness of relationship. But what we long for is a marriage. Not a marriage here and now, but the Bible ends with a marriage between us and God. It's a marriage uh, that will be with one who loves us perfectly, one who never lets us down, one who never kind of finds faults with us and walks away, uh, but one who is closer than the closest friend, who sticks closer than a brother. It's a marriage that will never end and will be happier uh, than even the happiest wedding couple here on earth. It's a marriage to the Lord. It's not wrong to long. Now, it might be that you're listening to this and you're not, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. And if that's the case, can I encourage you? This is what your heart longs for. Somebody once said that our hearts are restless until they find God. It will try and fill uh, our kind of voids in our hearts with all sorts of different things, won't we? Relationship after relationship. Uh, maybe material stuff. Uh, maybe entertainment. But they're restless until they find the Lord. Can I invite you to get to know him? Roses are red, violets are blue. Remember this Valentine's, that God is with you. Well, our thanks go to Ben Tanner. And actually, Ben will be back in a few moments to lead us all in a prayer and blessing. But I hope you've enjoyed the programme this week. And if you've seen anything that's given you food for thought, why not leave a comment that others can share? And please remember to press the subscribe button so that you'll be notified when the programme's ready for you to watch next weekend and the like button so that others will get a chance to see if this is a series that they might enjoy too. So I will look forward to your company again next weekend. And in the meantime, from me, Pam Rhodes, I wish you lots of love. Bye now. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love, both today and forevermore. Amen. is
And if you've enjoyed Sunday Night Live, don't forget to press the subscribe and like buttons so that your device will offer you future editions each week and recognise that this is a programme of interest to you and others.